In the meantime, exiled and penniless, he had more prosaic concerns to deal with. In Zurich, he was fortunate to meet a couple whose fabulous wealth was matched by their enthusiasm for his talent. So there's Otto, who was a, a silk merchant with big interests in America, and his wife, Matilda. Yes, and Wesendorf was quite a patron of the arts and a fan of Wagner, is that right? That's right. Uh, it was his writings, really, that caught Matilda's eye at first. Oh, more than his music? At first, uh, she began reading his writings, and he took a shine to Matilda immediately and took an even bigger shine to Otto's money. Yes. He was writing to friends about it within just a few weeks. Really? He'd met this rather nice woman with this very, very wealthy husband. Wagner was a married man, although his relationship with his wife, Minna, was tempestuous. He had enjoyed his share of affairs over the years, but his infatuation with Mathilde Weisendonck had a special intensity. No one knows exactly what went on behind closed doors here, but it's clear that the relationship fired Wagner's creativity. He wrote music inspired by her poetry, including a piece which later evolved into one of his greatest operas. On the 23rd of December, 1857, Wagner performed a song of Mathilde Weisendonck that he dedicated to her called Träume, Dreams. He orchestrated it, and we're about to hear it in exactly the room it was first performed here at the Villa Weisendonck. Wagner's Swiss exile was a period of intense creativity. But here, as elsewhere in the story, a shadow falls across his sublime music. In Switzerland, he wrote an article called Jewishness in Music, which stains his reputation to this day. It is ornamented, if you like, or anti-ornamented, with some genuinely revolting pieces of anti-Semitism. He yeah. talks constantly about a kind of, at a physical, visceral level of repulsion, instinctive repulsion that we feel towards the Jews. So, so there is a real anti-Semitism in that sense of literally, as people to be in a room with, they are revolting, it's suggested, and that is, to us, so horrible as, as to be, you know, just slappable and, and ghastly. We put out of consideration people who can talk like that, especially these days, especially after the Holocaust. Anti-Semitism back then, of course, wasn't associated with the Holocaust. Uh, it was uh, socially acceptable in a way that we couldn't imagine today, thankfully. But Wagner was by no means alone. Anti-Semitism was widespread in 19th century Germany, even amongst political liberals like Wagner. But his outburst had a personal dimension too, fueled by his jealousy of the celebrated Jewish composers Mendelssohn and Meyerbeer. Yes, Mendelssohn. 
this day, people love his violin concerto and much of his um, octets, his you know, Midsummer Night's Dream. He's a very popular composer. Meyer Bear's less well known. In his day, he was Stephen Sondheim, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber, all rolled into one. Yeah. Uh, he was the most successful composer there was in the 1840s, 1850s. Mendelssohn and Meyer Bear, they had money, they had success, um, they had uh, nice lives. Wagner was small, ugly. Uh, virtue destitute and had tried to make a success in Paris and had failed miserably yes. and he wanted to vent his anger on someone and the two most natural people happened to be the two most successful people he'd ever known. There are some people that believe and I tend to agree with them that Wagner needed to create some kind of major disturbance in his life. He needed some kind of weird kick yeah. To get him going. He needed an enemy, perhaps. He needed... Uh... An enemy, something or other, or an enemy within himself. Yeah. He needed to um, disturb... He needed to muddy the waters around him. Yeah. In order to write the music that he did. I have this fantasy. It's typically pathetic and typically a fantasy, uh, so very me, uh, in which I go back in time as an Englishman and I write letters to Wagner. I keep writing saying, I have to talk to you. And I say to him, listen, you, you, you're on the brink of becoming the greatest artist of the 19th century and future generations will forget that simply because of this nasty little essay that you're writing and because of the effect it'll have. Unless, you know, and I can think, what would he say to that? If he had known that the person who was most hurt by his anti-Semitism was himself, it isn't easy to confront Wagner, is it? No, it's not. It's often very unpleasant. Yeah. But just because he may have been a nasty little man uh, and a nasty anti-Semite doesn't mean that his music is not as supreme as it is. If this sounds familiar, that's because it grew out of Träume, the piece we've just heard. It's the love duet from Act Two of Wagner's opera Tristan and Isolde. In 1857, he abandoned work on the ring to focus on this new piece. The story of a forbidden love affair between the knight Tristan and Isolde, who's betrothed to another man. It's based on ancient legend, but the music was strikingly avant-garde, pushing at the boundaries of conventional harmony. And it all starts with this. The so-called Tristan chord. It may not look revolutionary, but it must have astonished the first audiences who heard it. Rather than progressing to a harmonious resolution, as musical convention expected, it evolves into another unresolved discord instead. I've come to the house where Wagner once lived to explore that cluster of notes which opened the door to modern music. Wagner's piano, this was given to him, I can see, as a 
This is a pretty good piano, a gift from the Steinway factory to Richard Wagner in 1876. Uh, to celebrate the beginning of the... beginning the of the festival. festival. Yeah. And would you let me just try and play the... Um, of course. ...the famous chord. I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to do any more than that, but this chord here, I want you to explain why it's... Um, I mean, yes. It's the first chord of yes, yes, Tristan yes. in the Prelude. Yes. I'm playing the Tristan chord on Wagner's own piano. Yeah. I have to pinch myself to see that I'm not dreaming. Yes, very important. There it is. The famous yeah. Justin Court. Welcome with the other and two minutes. Oh, that's it, they're there, there on the E and the A flat. So that's it. Yes. Ah. This chord, if someone was to look it up on Wikipedia, they'd find a huge entry just on this chord. Mm. What is it about this chord? It's a chord of tension, of longing. Yeah. The first voice goes up. Like you played, yes, right? That, that longing, And the yeah. other voices go down. So this is a depression. And this at the same time. Yes. This is where Wagner's genius as a yes. composer merges with his brilliance as a dramatist. His music keeps you on the edge of your seat, longing for the unbearable tension of those opening chords to be resolved. Yes. It almost happens in Act Two, when the lovers meet in secret to consummate their passion. Yeah, it sounds vulgar, but it really is a coitus interruptus in the, yes. in the Liebesnacht, the great duet, where it, you think it's yes. going to arrive then, don't you? Yes. And then in comes... It's very erotic music. In comes, yeah. Rette dich, Tristan happens. It's, yeah. uh, and and it's, it's, a, it's as if people have dis, are literally in bed with each other and they are actually making love, and just as the climax is about to arrive, bang, someone comes in and... and... That's interrupted. Exactly. Yeah. It's fantastic. Interrupted. It's such a moment, isn't it? Yes. So now I nice. show you the non-interruption, the transformation. Yeah. Finally, after four hours of the most glorious, gut-wrenching music, the psychological drama launched by that famous opening chord reaches its tragic climax. Now, for the last time, the longing motif comes back. Chromatic scale going upwards, leading that E is going to come to, to the transition e. to transcendence. It's not so easy. It's not. piano playing. I get, no, I get <laughs> overexcited. Uh, but my goodness, to have been even a small part of it. Yes. <laughs> You've made me the happiest man in Germany today. There's nothing to say. No, there is nothing to say. That's it's, exactly um, the point. Extremely good music.
1860, Wagner's Swiss exile finally ended. He was 47 and his music had made him internationally famous. But he still had enormous debts, thanks to his itinerant lifestyle and legendary extravagance. To raise cash, he toured Europe as a conductor. Ooh, ooh, look. I'm pretty sure I don't have any Russian, but that must be the Russian for ring there, beginning with coal. Um, so there it is, Richard Wagner's Tetralogy, The Ring and the Nibelung. And then the top right, Mariinsky Theatre. It looks gorgeous. Let's go in and see what it's like. The Mariinsky Theatre has always been a landmark building in Russian cultural life, famous for its opera and ballet. You might be more familiar with the name given to it during the Soviet period, when it was known as the Kirov. They're preparing a new staging of The Ring, masterminded by this man, conductor Valery Gergiev, the Mariinsky's artistic director. horned helmets or Aryan ice maidens on show here. This production is inspired by the myths and legends of Gergiev's homeland, North Ossetia, a reminder that Wagner's work is open to endless reinterpretation. Wagner actually came to Russia and conducted some orchestral passages from his works, which were in progress and had been produced elsewhere. But uh, some of them, for the first time here, the Ride of the Valkyrie, for example, was first heard in Russia. He was paid a princely sum to come and conduct in Russia. And whatever people thought of the music, and many people were affronted and astounded and simply uncomprehending, uh, it was very revolutionary. No one had ever heard anything like it. But whatever people thought of that, they were really impressed by his conducting. He faced with his back to the audience, the orchestra. That may seem normal to us, but in its day, that was considered very revolutionary. I think it will be totally impossible to imagine the history of...